Yeah, it's Christmas time. What is up, my gaggle of geeks? And welcome to another episode where it's time to talk about the end of the year, what we loved, what our favorite films of 2023 are. And it's crazy to even be saying to, we're moving into 2024. This year ha was like a roller coaster that felt rickety the entire time, but we made it out. We can go to the next ride at the carnival of what this life is. Welcome, everybody. I am here with a very special guest, Scott Menzel. Welcome. Thank you so much, Patrick. Love being here with the you. Audience. Hold on, I missed the applause. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's honestly the real way people respond. Silence. <laughs> no, no, no. We've we've got sound effects for those. It just depends on what your picks are. If if one of them oh, I have okay. problems with, we're gonna hit the cricket button. Okay. 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 <laughs> well, Scott, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, for everybody that don't know. Make sure that you're tuning in to the 2024 Astro Film Awards, January 6th, and the Astro TV Awards, January 8th. These are amazing ceremonies. They're so much fun. And honestly, the, the ability to be able to be a part of this is awesome. And I'm just excited that me and you just get to nerd out and talk about some of these movies. Here's where you can follow Scott as well. So tell me, Scott, what are some, of, before we get into our top 10, what are some of your honorable mentions for this year? So, as we were talking before we came on today, it's really hard to put together a best of list mm. versus a favorites list. And I think there is a significant difference between the two. For me, like, favorites are movies that I would rewatch and I enjoyed watching. Best of is sort of the whole entire picture where I break down, like, script and filmmaking and acting and cinematography and editing. So my honorable mentions will be more of favorites and the top 10 will actually be what I believe are the 10 best films of the year. Nice. And if for, yeah, we'll, we'll jump into mine in just a sec, but tell me what, what's one of your first honorable mentions. So I, I have two here and these are movies that made me, happy they made me smile uh they entertained the hell out of me and the first one's bottoms uh i did not expect to like this movie at all to be honest with you uh i saw the trailer i heard about it out south by southwest and i just thought eh, you know i'll see this movie eventually and i wound up never seeing it until it was in a theater like only in like a handful of theaters left and I went on the afternoon. It was me and one other person in the theater. And I enjoyed it immensely. Um, just funny, smart, and like it never takes itself too seriously. And it's just a ride. And I really, really enjoy it. Um, yeah, my I second, we're actually looking at Bottoms being, we're, we're twinning out on this because Bottoms okay. is my honorable mentions too. Okay. What, 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 what was your reaction to it? Oh, so same thing. When I saw the trailer, I kind of had the idea that this was, it had a Scott Pilgrim versus the world vibe where it was really fast paced. The jokes were going to be like five in one sentence in some cases. And it just was going to be silly, like hyper realistic. And I think they crushed it, especially when it gets to the end. Like one of the funniest endings of the entire year for me was in bottoms, but there's just, I have a lot of comedies on my top 10 list, so I couldn't fit them all in. And that's where I was thinking with mine. When did you see it? Um, so I think it came out in August and I wound up seeing it. I want to say it was like September. Like mm -hmm. I, it was like after the festivals, it was after TIFF. It was after Talia ride. Like I said, I think it was like in that last week before it left theaters. Because I just heard so many great things about it, but then I also heard on the other side of the spectrum as well, where like people were like talking about like, oh, this movie's awful, like it's terrible, like just like we a lot of movies are now as time mm -hmm. goes on. At first, like all the praise for poor things, I was one of the first people to kind of say this movie's not that great, and then everyone's like, oh my god, it's the best movie ever, and now you're slowly starting to see more and more people come out and saying like, yeah, it's not as great as what people say it was. So that was the interesting thing with Bottoms because Bottoms, what intrigued me was how divisive the re reviews were because mm -hmm. at first it came out and they were glowing and I was like, okay, like there's no way this movie's going to live up to those expectations. And then a lot of hate kind of came with it. And then I eventually went to see it and I was like, wow, like I'm on 
the the higher side on this movie. So yeah, and again, like you said, it's so outrageous and so over the top that you just have to go along for the ride. I understand why people don't like this movie. It's so right. weird not to like, but if you you you're you're in for it and you can appreciate what's going on, it works really well. It's definitely a get on board or just get out of the way because it's it's got. It's got its comedy humor, and honestly, it's kind of like me. If I if I've had a conversation with somebody too long, and my ADHD has kicked in, and I've given them like five different backstories to just one question that they asked, like how my day was, and I'm like, it began when I was just a child, and then going through tons of backs. That's what Bottoms is, and that, in fact, there's one joke in particular about how uh, somebody's marriage is going to hypothetically turn out that goes for so long. It's one of the best jokes of the whole movie. I strongly recommend that people see it that was actually my rule with the top tens is like even though we're listing 10 there are so many films that you need to see this year that are totally worthy 10 does not really cut it but because we have lists and you know seo and this is great for both it's it's what we have to do right now and we all have yes. letterboxed right <laughs> right but um let's go into uh one of one of my honorable mentions, and this is this is going to actually, maybe it'll be a little controversial. It's Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse for me. Now, I think that it's a fantastic animated film, but there's something about it still being a somewhat incomplete story where I have to hold off on it being in my top 10 just because some other films that ended up rounding themselves out more, ha having more of a full story, really sold themselves to me this on the other hand i thought it was beautiful in so many aspects i really particularly loved gwen's story but that still is not necessarily i don't know it didn't measure up i'm gonna need a lot of hate for that what about you <laughs> uh well listen you're gonna get some hate i'm gonna get some hate right now saying this movie um the flash uh i was lucky enough to see it at CinemaCon was part of the first audience to see it. Um, I don't really like to have the humble brag aspect of that, but, you know, there is something about going to festivals, seeing movies for the first time, and actually being able to form your own opinion on something before the masses kind of see it. And then you mm -hmm. kind of like, oh, like what, what is, because it kind of, I, I don't think people realize this, but like there's sort of these expectations when you go into a lot of movies uh, if you screen multiple times and you hear all this buzz, they're sort of like, oh, I didn't like this or I didn't like this as much as others or I like this too much. What the case was, you know, what that case, what that looks like to people. It's really interesting for me because I really love going into movies with a fresh perspective. It's one of the reasons why every single year, even though I don't think that the Sundance movies lately of the last couple of years are as strong. I still love going to Sundance because I love to discover movies for the first time. And Flash, I was super excited about because it's no stranger to anyone who knows me. You know, I was a big fan of the Snyderverse. Um, I really was. Uh, the, the Justice League, the four-hour cut of that movie, I think, is, is, is a near-perfect masterpiece for a superhero movie. And The Flash was my favorite character in that universe. And this movie to me was a ton of fun. Uh, I saw it three times in the theater. Uh, CinemaCon was the first time where it had the the different ending than the one that ultimately ended up in the movie. Uh, there was a discussion. Can you that down real quick? What was the original ending? The original ending what did not have George Clooney. Okay. It actually, just kind of cut. And oh, so it, did, it just didn't show anybody. No. Oh, okay. So it, I, I think certain people didn't really like the George Clooney thing. I didn't really carry the way. It didn't really make or break the movie for me. Um, but me, I think another thing that really resonated with me about The Flash was, number one, you know, the Snyderverse. But number two, my favorite superhero movie growing up was Batman and Batman Returns. So mm -hmm. Michael Keaton back, that excited me. And yes, it's probably weighs into my love of Tim Burton and nostalgia with how much I love Michael Keaton. But all of this kind of worked. And to me personally, the movie has a really strong emotional arc. I think the the ending of the movie, it's, it's it was very hard not to get a little teary eyed with the story of Barry and you know the discovery of his mom and whatnot. I, I just really appreciated elements of the movie. Is it too long? Of course, like. 
most of these movies this year. I mean, every freaking movie is way too long. <laughs> but like, as a whole, it was fun. I revisited a couple times and I enjoyed it every time I revisited it. Absolutely. And a great plug for Sundance, by the way. Coming at the very end of January, ABC4 is going to be covering. Um, and I love that you're saying Batman, Batman Returns are some of your favorite Batman films, especially with Michael Keaton. And I, I liked the George Clooney cameo because as much as Keaton was my Batman, Val Kilmer and George Clooney were a huge part of my upbringing with it. They were the movies that my parents preferred I would watch because anytime they would see the penguin biting the head off of the fish or the sexy Michelle Pfeiffer while I'm, hey, a kid, it yeah. probably wasn't the best thing that they were like, hmm. He's really into that one. And I don't know if we should let him at this point. McDonald's didn't like it. Why should we? <laughs> <laughs> but when it comes to the flash, you know, I'm not going to knock it too much. I'll, I'll just say that maybe I was one of those people that came in with too high of expectations for what I wanted it to be. I I've since seen it a few more times. Um, there's something about the effects and I'll be tooting the horn that everybody else already has about the, some of the issues with that, uh, all of the, all of the issues when it comes to like just throwing cameos in, which is kind of funny because James Gunn recently talked about how much he hated cameo porn. I think he's what he referred yeah, to. Yeah, yeah. But he I, he was the one that was like, the Flash is brilliant. It's one of the greatest things. <laughs> well, I, I think it's hard because the Flash has came, came out in such a weird time too. I mean, listen, mm. all of the Ezra Miller stuff that, that happens, right? And I, I think people really struggle to separate the person from the artist, mm -hmm. um, you know, like I always say this, like, are we going to say that American beauty was not a great movie because Kevin Spacey is a horrible person, right? Like the movie itself is still very good. Right. Do I watch that movie now and like ever revisit it? No, because of the way that it is. But at the same time, like I'm able to separate like the filmmaking and all those people that were in it and the story and it all like works. And it's a great movie. Same with um, Usual Suspects, right? Same, mm -hmm. same thing. So with The Flash, for me, you know, I think a lot of people had that hard separation of church and state for that. They, they just couldn't get past the fact like, oh, Ezra has all this bad, these bad problems, these bad habits. You know, he suffers from mental illness. He has, he had drug abuse issues, all this stuff that we all know and we don't have to repeat. But people have a hard time separating separating those two things. The other thing is, is that the Flash actually came out right before the strikes, <laughs> mm, which yeah. the focal point of the strikes was AI. And when you watch the Flash, and you're talking about what you're talking about with the visual effects and the way that they incorporated certain characters from the legacy of DC into the movie using AI. I can understand also why people took offense to that. But at the same time, I I think I personally would have rather them do it the way that they did it than try to do like this motion capture randomness that's been going on, like in Indiana Jones with making someone young and using these mm -hmm. people. But it was also a great way to just pay homage to all of the classic DC films. But again, I understand. Again, no no disrespect to anyone who completely disagrees with me on this. But to me, the AI way of doing it, I don't know if it would have got as much heat if it wasn't in the conversation the, the way that it was this year. I feel like mm -hmm. if that happened like five years ago when this movie was originally supposed to come out, maybe that conversation people would have reacted very differently to it. Right. Well, and that's the other thing with this film. Like you're you're right. It's kind of it, it's already so outdated with what the plans were moving forward that it was kind of a nomad. It was in its own situation. And whether or not they end up greenlighting a flash two or whatever they end up Andy Muschietti at this point is well into Brave and the Bold. And I think that's going to be the direction they go. But I I think that there's merits on both sides with it. Yeah, I think so too. <laughs> And that's where the crickets chime in. <laughs> uh, <yeah. laughs> All right. Well, let's get into this. So I'm going to defer to you first with your top 10. And if in, if, would you like to do it kind of like 10, like you go 10, I go 10, nine, nine, or. Yeah. I, I mean, I just think that that keeps it interesting and it moves things along. And I, I, I'm trying to think of how we should do it. If we have the same movies, 
uh, you, you, you know, well, like, if I should not shot him, I'll, I'll just say like, we'll talk about that later. Well, let's call it like battleship, right? If you end up getting one, I'll be like, oh, you sunk my number two. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Sounds good. Cool. All, All right. right. Let's go with your number 10 first. All right. So another, another nod to Sundance. Uh, my number 10 pick is past lives. <laughs> Um, yeah. <laughs> I actually talked to uh, a lot of people about this movie very early on. And I, you know, I was one of the first people to go on Twitter and say, this movie is going to be part of the awards conversation. And mm -hmm. I remember everyone's like, no, it's not. And if it is, it might get screenplay and that's it. And here we are. Uh, now, 11 months later, and Greta Lee has been getting in actress across the board. It's been getting screenplay. It's been getting direction. It's a movie that really is simple. It kind of makes me think of the Before trilogy, and I think that's mm. the reason why I connected with it. Um, just the story of, like, two people who, you know, who had a relationship when they were young their lives went in different directions. They re reconvene. Uh, one of them is in a relationship. The other one is not. And it's this interesting dissection of relationships, friendships, and love from another time. Mm -hmm. And I just thought the three actors in this movie uh, were captivating. The movie is brilliantly shot. Celine Song should be very, very proud as this is our first uh, feature film. And um, it's just, it's just such a simple movie. And I, and I love simple movies and it's, it's engaging because the acting is great and the conversation is good and the script is amazing. So really, really like this one. Well, past lives, my friend is my number four direct hit sunk battleship. I think, <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, when I first saw this movie, it, it definitely brought up a lot of the before trilogy vibes to me. Um, it the it it's kind of weird. Like you you obviously want to put yourself in the in the situation and think, how do I relate to these characters in a lot of ways? And it's like that that kind of unrequited like young love, right? Where like you you think about that relationship and and this this character really had nothing else to think about for most of his life. And so getting that opportunity to go to America to meet her, the way that they tell this story, how it's just, it's innocent, but it's also very thoughtful. It's thought provoking. Um, the way that the characters interact with each other feel genuine and and kind. And it, I just love that theme so much. Um, the cinematography was beautiful. I remember the full one take that's just panning um, from one bridge over to the Brooklyn Bridge before it cuts to them at the Ferris wheel, the little merry-go-round thing. Yeah. Just some of the best cinematography. Uh, I was shocked that this was a directorial debut. Um, just really one of the best films of the year for me. And one that I can see myself keep going to. My wife did, was not the biggest fan of it. I think she's, she was more on like the, uh, oh, love, this is a little bit cheesy side. I, I'm much more of the romantic in the relationship. <laughs> <laughs> so it takes a lot of, but, but love, Don't, what about love? <laughs> <laughs> but still such a good film. Yes. Let's see. So for my number 10, I had, now this is a comedy that came out this year that I thought was, uh, honestly, it was firing in every cylinder. It's going to be joyride for me. I think First of all, the story is so is so funny. Uh, you have a little bit of bridesmaids, you have a little bit of the hangover, but you have a real good character-driven motive for why they're going and a cool, I don't know, side of of of, of a different area when she's going to meet her family, um, what ends up happening with that, and just the characters. They were so funny to me. Um, Stephanie Zhu was one of the best, some of the best joke, uh, jokes in the of the year so far. Um, yeah, Joyride is my number 10. What was your uh, number nine? My number nine is... Or actually, Air. what did you think of Joyride? I liked I liked Joyride. Um, I didn't love it as much as everyone. This is this is one of those movies that um, I think the hype got got to me. And I went to... See, I, I also saw it at CinemaCon. Mm. And I appreciate... This is one of those movies that I appreciate what it was trying to do 
the humor was a little too crude and crass for me. Mm. I'm not a big fan of this kind of humor. Um, uh, the the brides, like if if you go back through a lot of my history, like I I, I was not a huge fan of American Pie. I was not a huge fan. Mm fan of bridesmaids um and i know a lot of people love these movies and i and i understand why people love joyride but to me it's the characters and the energy and the direction that elevate the movie i could i could take it or leave the jokes but i did like the story and i did like the characters right now that's what keeps you engaged is how how well is the story attached to the comedy otherwise it it really does just go into I don't know. There's a new police academy, right? How many of those have there been? Like eight? Yeah. Is or there another? Eight? Are they making another one? I believe they just dropped a trailer for it. Oh my god. On Netflix. I, I mean, I grew up with those movies. I love the first three or four of them, and then like no the more. story disappears, right? Or it yeah, goes yeah. into a, yeah. yeah. But yeah, I'm with you there. For uh, my number, uh, actually, go with your uh, number nine. Nine. Sorry. My number nine is uh, Air. Ben Affleck's Air. Um, there's just something so simple about this movie. Again, you're going to hear me say that word a lot. Simplicity. Um, it reminds me of a movie from the eighties, something that's character driven, story driven, nothing's flashy or showy about the movie. It relies very heavily on the performances. I think this is probably like Matt Damon's best performance that he's ever given. Uh, he's just so great in the film. Um, I love Christmas Cena. I love Ben Affleck, Viola Davis. I feel like this is just one of those movies that showcases actors acting. And there's just something really special about watching movies that don't really have a lot going for them outside of sitting in like a boardroom, having a conversation or sitting in an office and having a conversation. Like most of this movie takes place inside a building. Like it, it's not a very like riveting, like, Oh, there's a beautiful shot of the sky or, or here's mountaintops or something. It's very simplistic in its filmmaking, but again, it's so driven by its story and its character work that it connects with me. I'm, I'm someone who always connects with characters and story more than visuals. And that's why I love Dare. Well, and it's also so well-written. Like the, the writing oh, in this, it, it's incredible. I, I think it's, it's really propped up by such a great ensemble cast. Everybody is kind of at the, at the top of their game toward going towards the same goal and i think ben affleck as a director has that ability whether you're talking about argo or you're talking about this it's a really strong overall team that are that are going into this um I, and i love uh, just as my job actually being something within like promotions and marketing and and all that stuff it's really fascinating to sit in those boardroom conversations and hear like <laughs> how do we sell this stuff to people like we we're, we're the number one three uh, we're the number three or four as far as shoes goes um we're trying to get the biggest fish we're gonna throw away all of our money to hopefully get one person it, i thought it was fascinating and yeah I, you know i would probably put that in my honorable mentions because it it I, I love talking about these because then we just get reminded how great all the movies are. Yes. <laughs> but you've already, you already trashed my number nine, Scott, and I can't forgive. I can't oh, forgive. I did? Okay. What is it? It's poor things. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Go ahead. Tell me about it. Tell me, about it. Tell, me, tell me what you loved about it. I want to know. I, I'm, I'm, I'm terrified. I think <laughs> first, uh, the the uh, the idea of a Frankenstein monster told in this way is really fascinating to me. Uh, Emma Stone, as far as her performance goes, this is probably her best performance she's ever given. Um, it's one that you you basically have to be a, a baby at the beginning and act all the way into being a fully grown woman that's smart, that that understands the world. And she has to learn that all in the span of two hours. And to me. It it really is something where I I couldn't see anybody else doing it, and the directing by by uh, it's Yorgos, right? Yeah, Yorgos Lanthimos. Yep. Honestly, uh, it, the wide angle lenses sometimes can be a little bit disorienting when they're like extra fisheye lens and stuff, but <laughs> it's also his style. So I appreciate that we have 
with directors like him or Ari Aster that are doing these really creative things. Um, I agree with a lot of the criticisms about the movie that there's too much of the same, the same, like kind of like sexy and it just keeps going over and over and over. And it's kind of hitting you over the head with those points, but just performance alone, Willem Dafoe, I thought was fascinating. He was up, he was hilarious. Anytime he had to do the bubble, like burp thing, <laughs> I was laughing my head off. Um, Remy Youssef being kind of like an innocent character, but also not really in a lot of ways because he, he, he kind of allows agency, but also is in it for himself in a lot of ways. It, it's such a strange dynamic. Um, but I get the criticisms for me, the performances, and, and the uniqueness of the story is what tipped it over. Okay, so no shit. I'll, I'll share some <laughs> thoughts on this. All right. So I'm not, I'm not going to downplay Emma Stone. I, mm -hmm. I think Emma Stone does everything she needs to do in the movie. I think she elevates the movie in every way. The movie rides on her shoulders, and she does a great job with the material. Mm. My problem is that this movie fails to have a good third act. The first act is very like weird and strange, and it dives into this idea of like, okay, this woman is, is kills herself, this scientist finds her takes the baby's brain, puts it into her body. And it's weird, right? And like, she's like learning about sexuality and whatnot. And I was like, okay, the first 20 minutes were like hard to sit through, like a little rough around the edges. And then it kind of gets interesting as they start doing the sexual exploration, especially my favorite part of the movie is actually the middle part where mm -hmm. she's on the cruise ship with like, Mark Ruffalo when they're like, she's learning about the world and learning about all these things. And like, mm -hmm. she, she gives someone money basically saying, oh, there's people struggling or whatever it is. I, I liked elements of the movie. Don't get me wrong. The problem is that when we get off the ship and you start seeing her mature and she grows and everything, the movie in that last act focuses so heavily on just like the sexualization over and over and over again that I wanted something more from it. I wanted to see this character grow and become like this leader, this, this person who was like inspirational and like just did something different. And, and, and essentially it just sort of becomes the whole first and part of the second act all over again, just right. in the stream where instead of her sleeping with one person, now she's just sleeping with everyone. Mm -hmm. And, I'm sorry, I, I know this is a controversial opinion, but like the way that this is shot from the male gaze, and again, I know Emma Stone's a producer on this movie, so I'm not I'm not downplaying that she didn't have some say in it, but the way that it was shot from, from a male gaze is way different than if you gave this to a Greta Girl wig or an Emerald Fennell or someone else would have directed the story, those scenes would have been filmed differently and captured differently. There was no, there was no things about males like kind of showing them. It was very, in my opinion, just sort of like this pseudo feminism. And it it, it bothered me. I, I don't know what else to say. That that third act, just like I wish it was something else. I was I was okay with the middle, but that third act just like threw, went so off the rails and was so repetitive and so over the top that it just lost me. No, that's respectable. And it's not a complaint that I haven't, that we haven't heard, especially like on film Twitter and, and in regards to like, they're valid criticisms too. Um, I think just for me, it, it was, it was much more on the, I don't know. It's like what you said, Emma Stone elevates the material so much. It's hard to ignore that aspect the most, even if towards the end it from, for, um, for a lot of us, it was kind of like, we're just doing the same thing over and over. <laughs> we understand the message. We understand we're just, just stop. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. A hundred percent. Now what's your number eight? All right. My number eight pick is anatomy of a fall. I saw this also at Telluride. And this was one of those movies that 
I really didn't know much about. I talked to one of the folks at Neon at another screening. They were like, are you going to go see our movie, Anatomy of a Fall? I said, I've heard you know a lot of buzz about it, but I have no idea what it was about. And it's one of those mysteries that is really deeply engaging. I love the fact that it's also partly a um, courtroom drama. So it, it's, it, there's a mystery aspect to it. There's a courtroom drama and mis- um, aspect to it. And it's elevated by um, Sandra Huller's like incredible performance. Like the entire movie, I'm like, did she do it? Did she not do it? Did the kid do it? Who did this? Like you're, and then you even walk away from the movie. And it, it was one of those great movies that when I was walking out of it, I was with like a festival audience, not not just critics, but like an actual festival audience. And everyone was talking like, do you think she did it? Who did it? And I I love movies like that. Movies that actually get you talking and they don't spoon feed you everything. You just sort of go like, wow, that left me thinking. It left me contemplating. It made me want to have a conversation. And I, I think that's one of the biggest praises you can give a movie is that you want to talk about it afterwards. Mm hmm. Yeah, I, I agree with every point of that. Uh, it was it was one of those slow burn films that like the further into the court drama that they went, the, the more fascinated I was with what were what really where was all of the story going to like when it was hitting coming to a head, it got more and more fascinating to me. Um, I don't know. It, it just it just didn't hit me for my for my top 10. But it, it is definitely one that when it came to the international film categories and stuff, it was certainly up there especially with the performances if i ever hear that song again i'm gonna lose my mind (laughs) that's like my one big complaint boy they like anytime i hear um what what do they call them cog shells the (laughs) if somebody rattles that off i'm just gonna sprint away as fast as i can (laughs) i i i I get you i get you on it i don't disagree right well for my number eight i went another comedy here this is one that i have a lot of personal um i guess history with because i was a theater kid growing up in high school and theater camp was one of the funniest most ridiculous comedies of the year and and they executed it so brilliantly Uh, i think this is is this ben platt's apology for dear evan hansen i don't know (laughs) it could be (laughs) hey hey listen i loved i loved this movie too i really did um, so good. So good. Uh, it's, it's one of those movies that you really have to be into the theater to appreciate it. Right. If you're in a theater. It's, it's like a love letter to pretty much the classics to everything modern. Like it just mm-hmm. plays to everyone. Well, not only that, like it, it's really fascinating to, cause we've all seen like the coming of age films where they start walking through the court hall and they're, or like the little like yard area. And they're like, those are the jocks. Those are the cowboy, like the 10 things I hate about you scene. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And this is like a full fledged delve into one of those groups that just cannot, cannot see the ridiculousness of their plights and, and their concerns and issues. And, <laughs> and though it, I don't know. The beginning sets it up so brilliantly. And from there, the humor just is like rapid fire. Every every minute counts as far as the comedy goes. I love the way that it's shot kind of in like that mockumentary style. Um, and all the characters were really, really like genuine. <laughs> I, I really didn't think uh, Ben Platt would be able to kind of like pull off a character like this. When I first started watching the movie, I was like, oh, boy, or, like theater camp we got him i'm still kind of reeling from that last iteration of something that we had so where are we going from here and and i think he he leaned into it very well um yeah that was mine anything else you have for this no i mean i love i love the the movie i love the music um i can't remember that guy's name jimmy the guy the the guy who takes over the camp yeah yeah that yeah. guy's hilarious i mean he he's such a like character actor like i've seen him pretty much play that character so many times before but he was so perfect in this movie like Mm. uh, nick and molly really did a great job casting him in that performance totally totally well let's move into number seven all right my number seven pick is the iron claw 
a movie that I I really wish was getting more love right now. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel like this movie screamed very last minute, um, and A twenty four had a feeling that it was going to be really strongly reviewed and that people were going to respond to it. But the rollout over the last couple of weeks has been a little bit strange because I think it missed most of the critics groups now because I didn't pick up in ours. It didn't pick up in critics choice. It hasn't picked up in the New York um, film critics online. So I'm hoping that they push this movie a little harder in the next couple of weeks, um, and especially into the new year to maybe get some Oscar nominations. Mm -hmm. Because to me, it's a very heavy film. It's not an enjoyable watch at all, but it's a great showcase of acting. And I think this mm -hmm. is really Zac Afron's best performance. And he goes all in and he really kind of like becomes this, this character. And the ensemble here is is some of the best ensemble work this year. I mean, if there's one takeaway I think I have from this year is that the movies that have these large casts nail it. I mean, you go Color Purple, you go Air, you go Iron Claw, you go Barbie. I mean, the voice work in Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse, like right. ensembles are like where it is at in 2023. Some of the best cast ensembles in recent memory. No, I totally agree. And I agree with you a lot with the Iron Claw because it is my number five for my top 10 list. Uh, I, I agree on every point. Zac Efron gives a heartbreaking performance, but really a physically demanding performance too. I, I've, I've been, when I start falling in love with these films, I, I try to find an, any and all information that I can. And like learning about the behind the scenes, how they were rehearsing and it was all kind of shot uh, in one thing. Like they, they didn't really break from it. So it would be like a seven minute routine that they would have to go through. And by the end, they were actually just so physically exhausted that um, not only the physical part of it, but also just the story about brotherhood and about kind of the, the way that uh, I, I know we, we the, the term toxic masculinity masculinity gets thrown away thrown out oh all my God. And, and in this the dad the performance done there was so excellent the way that he really leaned into it he could have honestly done a caricature of this it could have been like dewey cox's dad where he just shows up he goes wrong kid dad and then just goes on with his day but it, everything feels so real everything as far as how he just wants his kids to be strong and succeed at whatever they're doing and whatever the cost but it's got to be his definition of what success is even if it seems like some of his kids he, there's arguments to be made for some of the kids that if they had pushed for the for the dream that they had that maybe they would still be alive maybe they'd be i don't know if that's too far of a stretch but yeah. it it really is fascinating the the only thing that made me confused at the beginning, and I can I can understand it, is that they completely omitted a brother. Yes, uh, that, was weird, that was a weird choice, and I have no idea why. I haven't researched it. Have you researched that at all? Why they did that? There was something to the to the effect, and I talked with John Rocco about this, so I'll I'll, I'll bring up my debate on live. So John, comment on this. I'll I'll attack you with the truth. I having taking one of them out even though all of the i think it was three committed suicide or was it four? Oh, i i i, 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 so I, didn't, do, I didn't do a deep enough dive into this. All, all i know is that that one brother was missing mm -hmm. and i remember going like why did they do that they from what it sounds like it's redundant that like it was it that was a one too many suicides in in I mean, the movie's heavy like i get it but mm -hmm. like it takes Honey, away from the theme people, because you're us, choosing us. a side. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You're like, it's like you're saying, like as a parent, like this is not this is a kid I don't like as much. Exactly, so that's what I was thinking. Out. Which, which I I had to sit with myself for about a half hour and kind of chuckle because it is kind of ridiculous when you think about it. It's like this movie is all about our brothers, as like one hand is like shoving the <laughs> other one back. <laughs> don't look over here. <laughs> yes. Uh, but still, such a very powerful film, uh, well acted by everybody. The cast is, is fantastic. Um, yeah, cannot agree with you more on that. For 
my number seven, I went with Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Mutant Mayhem. Uh, this did what I think Into the Spider-Verse did when it first came out. Um, that's honestly why I, I went with this uh, in over uh, Spider-Verse for my top 10. Not only was the animation kind of rough around the edges, but still like very visually appealing and, and mesmerizing to watch in a lot of instances. They did something again with Spider-Man. We're going to make the kids teenagers. We're going to give them stakes that are that are to scale for them. Not necessarily like we need to save the world. Of course, that's in it. But the big thing is how do we just connect with people? How do we get out of the sewers and actually live a normal life? And just wanting to go to high school as like the big driving force for a lot of it was fascinating to me. Uh, the humor was hilarious. Um, the uh, no diggity fight scene was such a throwback to the original Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles uh, video game and stuff. Um, when they played Go Ninja, Go Ninja, Go, it was it was my jam, man. All of these movies I watched as a kid growing up, one, two, and three. Yeah, I even liked three. I know how problematic it is now, but I was dancing my butt off as a little kid at the introduction of the first. You remember when they're in the subway and it pans down and everybody's doing like a weird kung fu fight solo? While a weird rock and roll song is playing. And uh, Turtles in Time or whatever the heck that was. Yeah, am I weird for remembering that? Yeah, I, I, I listen. I, I love <laughs> the first two movies so very much. Oh, yeah. I blacked out everything about that third one. <laughs> Even I, blacked, I, I don't remember anything about that movie. I mean, it sounds vaguely familiar now that you're saying it. Oh, it's so problematic, though. But uh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I mean... There's, there was I didn't think about that when I was watching the movie, but I remember not liking it. Yeah, I I don't know. Why are we talking about that? This new movie was <laughs> because massive. you're talking about Ninja Turtles and like you have to because it plays so much into the legacy of the movie. And I agree with you. Like I did not expect like when they first came out with this, I was like, oh my god, are they really trying to reboot freaking Ninja Turtles again? Like how many times have we done this already? It hasn't worked. So again, I went into this movie with like a negative Nancy going into it and going like, oh, yeah, I guess here we go. I I, I, I have to say this, and I, I've said this in a lot over the last couple of years. Seth Rogen, as he's gotten older and, how, and as he's matured, I've really grown a lot of respect for him. Mm. When he was first in like those movies and he was playing the same character, the one no character over and over and over again, like the guy who smokes pot and just laughs with the funny voice, you know, and the funny laugh, like it didn't work for me, but it was something when he did that movie with Charlize Theron. I can't remember what the heck the name of that movie was. Oh, almost. The, something. Yeah. Don't worry about it. I know. I can't remember what it was. Either, but it was like, that was the movie that turned the corner. And then I started watching him more and I started seeing him produce things. Like you talk about Joyride a little bit earlier, the fact that he came on as a producer and helped make that happen. Like that says a lot about him as a, as a person, as an individual. And to see him take the beloved property that, I mean, let's just be honest, has been destroyed over the last like 10 Home years, treated. really destroyed Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And mm -hmm. to sort of revitalize it, and make it fun, and yet play home homage to the original stuff, yet be relatable for a new generation, adding in teenagers to actually voice the turtles. It, it was it was really magical. And I want to say something to you that I've heard from a couple people. Oh no, you're not alone on thinking that it's better than Spider Verse. Really, I've heard this conversation. I, I've been to a lot of like FYC things. There's one, one person I've talked to in particular. I can't remember the person's name. I apologize if they're watching the stream. But he had this conversation. The same thing, and it had the same points that you had about how it felt fresh, a little bit fresher than Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. Mm -hmm. Now, for me, it's hard for those two movies because I think I was so blown away by the first Spider-Verse movie, and I wasn't expecting to be, and I saw this one. And I loved it. And then I saw it with the live orchestra, which just elevated it even more. Mm. So I, I might have a little bit more of a bias towards Spider-Verse because of the experiences that I had with it. But I love the mm. Ninja Turtle movie too. No, that's totally fair. I think that I could probably pull to 
my my enhancement of this really did come from just getting to get into that nostalgia again like eating a you know those little pan pizza hut pizzas that we that they sell at your local megaplex was just dope it's just like i'm eating pizza and at an early screening for a teenage mutant ninja turtles movie it, of course it enhanced it but then i watched it like eight more times and i knew i loved it after that so i i'm really glad that we agree on this one um but i'm excited to hear what your number six is scott all right my number six is are you there god it's me margaret Ooh, <laughs> Uh, talk oh, about another movie. Sure. <laughs> did, you, did you like? Did you like this one? Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, this is it came a, out too early though. It came out too early. It was also a movie that I knew was never going to be a box office darling. It was going to be a film Twitter favorite. And again, what? Why did this movie work? Like, let's let's mm. break this movie down. Why does it work? Very simple. Four central characters that we're focusing on. You have a mom, you have a dad, you have a grandmother, you have Margaret, right? Sure, Margaret has her little group of friends, but it ultimately is just a character-driven story about a little girl coming to terms with trying to understand her body and growing up. And it feels so authentic, so honest, so intimate, and it's just, again, everything that I love about movies is mm -hmm. great storytelling, smart scripts, simple direction, but a movie that just sticks with you. And I'm so glad that Rachel McAdams has been getting all this love from all the critics groups again. Mm -hmm. Like normally I, I always think that critic groups fall into this, 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 this hyperbolic state of like, nominating a bunch of movies that like are really just inside baseball mm -hmm. that it's great to see a movie like this kind of get recognition and have people talking about it over and over again because it was a great film the older generation of people who saw this movie and watched it and connected with it loved it as well it just is the type of movie that we have been so reprogrammed now to not watch in theaters just like comedy, mm -hmm. why Joyride did not do well, because we've been programmed to watch movies like that on Netflix, on Prime Video. We don't go see these movies in theaters anymore. Mm -hmm. And it's a really unfortunate, but um, I, I really do believe uh, Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret is is one of the best films of the year. It was it was one that I saw in theaters, and I, I really loved it too. Rachel McAdams did such a phenomenal job in her role. Um, I, I really love with this film that, first of all, it's it's not trying to like shove any type of narrative down your throat, right? It's just giving you the cold hard facts about what this girl's life is and what she's going through. And it's something that every girl can relate to in a lot of ways. Are you there, God? It's me, Margaret and Barbie could be like a, a wonderful double feature night for anybody that wanted to check out something that just was about female empowerment in whether you're a young woman or whether you're older. It's it's just something that I think speaks to a lot of people and should be seen by a lot of people, especially in this day and age where we're having rights revoked, we're having really idiotic politicians and people in our government that know nothing, that like actively refuse to learn about just basic anatomy and basic stuff that that both that men go through that women go through but the weirdly enough the stuff the men go through they seem to help them but when it goes to women not so much this film does such a good job of maybe bringing that group in to maybe have them understand something with a beautiful simple story i'll say i'll use your word too simple that it just is trying to give you a good story not really hit anything over the head just tell a good story and that's why I, I, I agree with you. This is a serious contender for a lot of awards this year. Yeah. Yeah. So for my number six, I actually, I'm really, we were going to record this yesterday, but uh, I got the chance to this morning check this film out. And I'm really glad I did because, man, I've got, I've even got a sound effect for this one. You ready? <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. We got Godzilla. But that's not <laughs> his actual roar. No need to like, um, actually this. But yeah, it this was such a knockout 
in so many ways. First of all, I did not know this was coming out at all. Um, the 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 groundswell of people saying go and watch this movie. This is one of the best films of the year, and and it just dropped out of nowhere. It, it's pretty fascinating. I love the story actually having real characters and real stakes within those characters. I think each uh, our main character was fascinating, and and uh, seeing his character growth, how they how they end up bringing back uh, characters from the beginning, kind of. Uh, closing out story arcs that really felt like just genius storytelling and genius writing. Um, the monster is, itself had so much that you could break down when it comes to just how it feels. It looks like it's just in pain. Like it's just a monster that is constantly like in agony, kind of like, um, I don't know if you remember in the first X-Men when, when Logan uh, is like fixing his knuckles after the oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. and, and uh, Rogue was like, does it hurt? And he goes, every time. That's kind of this Godzilla to me where it's like, he's got the healing factor. You know, he actually is Logan in a lot of ways. He's got a <laughs> healing factor. He's got things that retract out. Um, and that beam, the way that it makes everything look like literally an atomic bomb was was insane i cannot believe of what was the budget for this 19 like 15 million like it's something so outrageously low and, and it, it puts how do they make this movie films. yeah it puts some graphics to shame it must be because they they really were passionate about it like truly uh one of the best films of the year and and that's why it's my number six all right yeah i mean listen i i think there's a lot to be said that Every time there's another version of Godzilla, people really enjoy it. People rewatch these movies. There, it's 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 a legacy. It's been so dumb. The, the the Godzilla vs Kong was so dumb. Oh no, no, that's the thing. Years. Like the Americans shouldn't touch these movies. Like they don't know what they're yeah. doing. Like it's, it's I don't know if people know. Like, right it's, it's, they don't know what they're doing with them. They need to leave them to the experts who know what this is. There's a reason why. This character is still here. And what is it like 70, 80 years of Godzilla? Yeah, like, they had an opening. Of years. It. Mm -hmm. But th that's the thing. Do you think that mainstream audiences are really seeing? Uh, do they even know that there's a difference? Do they think this is just another sequel to the American version of Godzilla until they actually get told, no, this is something that is completely different, that has a lineage of being great stories. And this is the continuation of that. I don't. I don't think people know. I'm gonna be honest. I don't. I don't think the average person knows. If it's frustrating, <laughs> yeah. especially when it's so good, and we and it came right as they dropped the the second Godzilla vs Kong. I know, movie. which was a strategic move. I feel like mm -hmm. I cannot believe Godzilla had moves like that when he <laughs> when he crawled up and just sprinted with like his arms like this. <laughs> I was like, that's not how he moves. What what is happening? <laughs> Oh man. Well, uh, my number five was Iron Claw, but what was your number five? My number five was Barbie. Barbie. Very cool. And I think we're now getting into our, uh, I'm going to hide some of my stuff. How about that? All right. Now, now we're getting into hiding stuff. So tell me about Barbie. Uh, listen, I think this movie delivered on everything everyone wanted it to be. Uh, it was a great movie about female empowerment. It, it dived into every aspect of femalehood, whether you were like the beautiful Barbie girl, like Margot Robbie is, or whether you were the weirdo one, like Kate McKinnon is. Um, there was a Barbie for everyone. And it acknowledges that growing up, there wasn't that. And it was only until later, as the world changed, and we started having these conversations about how women look and how... Uh, the body types are and all these different um, nationalities and cultures that we needed to expand this universe. I, and I think they did such a great job with this film. And Greta Gerwig is really a special filmmaker. I, I have to say she, she was able to create something that felt like an independent film through a lot of it, but then also felt like a really big budget movie in other times. And she really walks that fine line between the two things. Now, is the movie perfect? No. I mean, there's there's elements of the movie that 
I think, you know, going on to the conversation I said earlier, it's definitely a little too long. There's a couple of jokes in the movie that I don't think really land or work. But as a whole, this sort of celebrates females of all different kinds. And it makes a great statement about men and men in power. But at the same time, even though it plays like against men, it still sort of celebrates men in the end. And I think there's something really great about that. The way that Ryan Gosling's character kind of comes full circle in this movie, mm -hmm. it's really special. And I think that's why Ken has become such a popular character. In some ways, I would say that Ryan Gosling's performance maybe a little bit outshines Margot Robbie's performance. Mm -hmm. Because it's one of those things that you get, like you see all these different perspectives of that character. And he has to learn how to live life without relying on Barbie, where mm -hmm. Barbie is more a journey of self-discovery. His character is learning how to, he's going through a self-discovery, but he's also learning how to live without the person who we thought needed to shape his life. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, I just, this this movie, again, when you talk about rewatchability, uh, I've seen this movie like three times. Totally. Last, uh, the Just Ken song, the musical number. <laughs> <laughs> I love all that. The, the Matchbox 20, I want to push you around. I that didn't scene. have a guitar in high school. Oh, my God. That <laughs> scene, that, the, the scene, I mean, you're talking about like a, a Margot Robbie scene, and I, there was that article that came out that they were going to cut it, right? Mm. We're sitting down at that bus stop with the older lady, and she looks at them and says, oh, you're so beautiful. You know, that's a, like a really amazing scene, like a really mm. amazing acting performance from her. You know, and again, she's so well-rounded in this movie. She gets to be bubbly and, and lovable, but then she has these these serious, dark moments of reflection. Um, and again, one of the best cast ensembles of the year. Just like everyone in this movie, totally on board. Some people are having more fun than other people are. I mean, Michael Sarah. I mean, come on. Michael Sarah is brilliant in this movie. <laughs> but yeah, great, great, great movie. Lots of rewatchability on it and um, total fun. I will talk about it in a second. We're so close. <laughs> <laughs> uh, number four for me, you're going to have to go again, man, because it's it was past lives. Um, I or did you? Yeah, you already talked. We about already it. talked about past yeah, lives. Yeah. Seriously, what one of the best films. But I can I can. Uh, what, what was your number three, Scott? My number three is American Fiction. American fiction. Oh, awesome. We can talk about this real quick. Four. No, not real quick. <laughs> Why did I say that? <laughs> we could breeze past this one so I can get to Barbie. <laughs> no, American fiction. I mean, so American fiction, what number is that for you? Four? Um, American fiction actually was not on my list. Oh, it's not? Okay. Mm. Uh, American fiction, I, I just think that Jeffrey Wright is fucking phenomenal in this movie sorry for dropping an f-bomb yeah, oh, totally. just 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 so good and even though the script of this movie tries to like bite off a little bit more than it can chew i mean there's a there's a lot going on in this movie the family dynamic stuff there's there's greatness in that moment but there's certain things that i feel like are a little bit too simplistic but the satire Oh my God, mm. the satire about what it's like to be black in America, all of the funny commentary about how white people are so afraid of interacting with black people and how they behave so much differently around them. I, I, I grew up in a house. I don't know if people know this about me, but I, I grew up in a household um, with foster children. I grew up in a foster care household. And I have four black brothers. And I went through life seeing how people would treat my brothers differently. And how I had conversations with people that didn't believe that they were related to me, that they were my family and all this stuff. And watching this movie, 
and some of the stuff that it does. Like there's there's a a commercial about Black History Month in this movie that you you said is like one of the best moments you said in another movie. Uh, Bottoms, I think you said had one of the fun. To me, that's the best, the funniest thing I've seen this year. There's a black, mm. the uh, Black History Month commercial that's in American fiction. I mean, it is it plays up the the tropes of like slave movies and police brutality movies, and just just brilliantly executed. And uh, Core Jefferson is a filmmaker to keep an eye on. Jeffrey Wright just one of his best performances, if not his best. And it's so great to actually see him take center stage because he's always a supporting character. He's always mm -hmm. supporting. And it's great to have a movie that's actually centered around him. No, um, I agree. Yeah, I love it. Jeffrey Wright is one of those actors that anything he's in, he enhances it. No matter what the, the outcome ends up being for that film, whether it's rotten or, or whatever, he, he is someone that's like, well, at least he was in it and he was great. And I think his relationship with Sterling K. Brown's character was really emotionally resonant. I think there was a lot to that. Um, I agree with you. I think there's a little bit of a weird parallel that this film has where the B story tries to overtake the A story in a lot of ways that uh, when it does the shift, I found myself just wanting to go to the other one instead. And maybe that's something that 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 made it not make my list. But the satire for me, it was absolutely incredible. The performances are great. I, I really, really was in, in love with the story on this. It just didn't really, I don't know, it didn't make it for me for some reason. I think it might have no, been. No, it's, it's, it's what you said. I, I think a lot of people have an issue with, it tries to tackle too much, right? There's there's mm. there's a love story in there, then there's a family falling apart story, there's death, there's a marriage. It, there's a lot to take in. And I think it's this is one of those movies that as much as I love it, I can acknowledge the flaws. And it it, it has the flaws of a first time feature. And mm. that is like it tries to do too much. And if it pulled back and it took two of those elements away, this would have been a 10 out of 10, the best film of the year. But, and I, and I originally had it until I rewatched it. And then I rewatched it and I knocked it down a bit. That's why mm -hmm. it's my number three now instead of my number one. Because when I walked out of it at TIFF, I was like, oh, this is the best movie. Nothing's going to beat this movie. And then I revisited it and I said, ooh, there's a couple of problems here. Not enough to knock it out of a, ten, a top ten, mm -hmm. but enough to knock it away from part from a number one. Gotcha. No, I my number three uh, for this is going to be Barbie, and I I'm I don't know I'm just going to be repeating the same things you said, just less smart. I I think the the way that they crafted the story and the way that they were able to take a take really a completely non serious idea. That it's been in the works for a while, this Barbie, oh and there's God, been so many different works. iterations. And I don't think anybody really had a lot of backing in believing it until Margot Robbie came in as a producer and and really like put her put her love into the ideas and and really sought talent and didn't take no for an answer when it came to Greta Gerwig and and with thinking that the whatever they they needed to do that they should just go along with it um there's so much commentary that you can have on this on commercializing um on on just purchasing things will ferrell's character was hilarious um there's a lot to say about the patriarchy and so many people got so up in arms about all of the patriarchy stuff and how they were how they were treating men i never found that in this like to, to me this was barbie land nobody has like a real like agency in anything they do and because barbie was number one it just it went in line with it i didn't see people complaining about this when it was toy story or when it was anything where they still like ken was still a bumbling idiot in the toy story films i don't see the difference between the two only that it got way more popular now um margot robbie i think gives a super nuanced performance where you have the stereotypical surface level barbie side but then when she has this as existential crisis and it's going to the real world and seeing uh, just what it's like for women and then going back and seeing what Ken has turned it into. It it really does bring in a lot of stuff. I said the same thing with uh, Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret. But this is a time where things just feel 
like they're being regressed to a previous time. And a lot of this kind of echoes that. And and America Ferreira's uh, monologue speech is one of the best things ever. Um, I love seeing this for the first time in a packed theater with people and seeing everybody's costumes, being, seeing everybody dressed up for it. I know this doesn't really like speak to the quality of the film, but the Barbenheimer move, movement, really, I think it enhanced uh, Oppenheimer and it boosted it. But it, it was really for Barbie, I think, in a lot of ways, where like the mainstream audiences, most people were really into seeing Barbie. And then all of like if you were married, we were the ones like trying to get our wife to go see Oppenheimer right after or however, you, whatever order you ended up doing. But right. seeing that movement in the pop culture movement was it really something we're not going to see for a while, especially with the way superhero films are right now. We don't have a big temple movie that's going to bring tons of people. And Avatar 2, it, it just shows up like a thief in the night. In the night, it just grabs two billion and we all don't know what happened. We're like, did that movie <laughs> even come out? I don't, yeah. know, I don't know what's going on. But Barbie, I think, is here to stay. Just don't make a sequel. It, it's I know. Like it is. I know. Nice. All right, so we jumped around. I didn't. You said that was your number three. My number four was Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. I already talked about it. We already talked about it, yep. so we don't have to do that. Uh, three, I talked about American Fiction. You talked about Barbie. And what now, was your number four? Did you say your number four? Four was uh, Past Lives. In five okay, so yes. Okay, so we're caught back up. So awesome. Okay, so then we're down. We're literally down to number two. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. And now. Now is where we're going to get real judgy with each other. There will right. there will be swear words and everything. All <laughs> right, I, I'm going to let you go to, go first. What's your number two? Okay, so for my number two, and we were just talking about the movement. It's Oppenheimer, Christopher Nolan. This is his this is his year for me for best director. He, he not only when I read the screenplay, seeing how personalized it was and how he wrote it, but also the ensemble with this how he approached Cillian Murphy and that that relationship between the two where he's never had a leading role in a Chris Nolan film. And that seems crazy to say at this point because he, he's he been in so much and he kind of is much like Michael Caine, kind of an ace in the hole. Anytime he shows up, he's, he's gold to what Nolan is doing. To give him that spotlight and for him to embody this character, this real person, and and show us both the the creative, the genius behind him but also the the horror of it of his arrogance of how he he really did think he was the biggest brain in the room but also knew how to orchestrate a group of scientists to make something uh there's so much to talk about with that uh i i just i couldn't speak highly enough about the performances here robert downey jr oh my goodness like him playing such a, a serious character that he talked a lot about this, about how he had to stay on script where normally he would never do that with like an Avengers film or any other film. So him using that challenge to his advantage, I he disappeared in the role for me. And for being Robert Downey Jr., one of the most recognizable stars right now, that was a big achievement for him too. Um, Emily Blunt was fantastic. There, There's just so much to talk about with this, but uh, you tell me what you thought of Oppenheimer. <laughs> oh no <laughs> i liked i liked oppenheimer i didn't love oppenheimer my problem with oppenheimer falls into the last 45 minutes so you have all this build up to the movie you you want to get to the bomb going off i want the, the bomb. bomb you want the bomb you're like you're you're, <laughs> you're waiting for it the bomb goes off and the movie keeps going yeah yes and you're like why does this movie keep going mm -hmm. and it goes on for 45 minutes and i just didn't care at that point so 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 here's what my again it's almost the same feeling that i had towards american fiction um is that the movie is overstuffed mm. the movie feels like it would have worked better as a mini series Mm -hmm. or something where it was broken into like two different chapters. Okay. But it gets you to the biggest part that you want to be in. And then it continues on. And I just feel like 
it's a little too much. And it's, it's interesting because it's the same issue I had with Killers of the Flower Moon mm -hmm. as time has gone on. Because when I first saw Killers of the Flower Moon, I was like, oh, it's great. Amazing. Love this movie. And then I watched it again. And I'm like, this courtroom scene at the end. Like, why? Mm -hmm. Why is this going on so long? We already know who did everything. We already know what's going on. And I, I think it just takes away from the film. Um, I, I can't deny that crafts-wise, it's a gorgeous-looking film. The score, the cinematography, the filmmaking, the acting. Um, I, I, I feel like at first I, I had this really negative reaction to how the female characters were written in the movie. It was one of my big things when I first saw it. I was like, how is anyone praising these, the, these actors? Because mm -hmm. they're so poorly written. But then um, I actually have to give a, a shout out to one of our members, um, Rachel Leishman, who basically posted online, like this was through Oppenheimer's perspective. So the movie being told through that showcases why the females were viewed that way mm -hmm. and why they were written in that way because he never really wanted to pay attention to them other than to sexualize them. Mm -hmm. And when Emily Blunt has that part in the courtroom scene at the end, it's like, of course, now he wants to show her in that light because she's standing up for him. So I give the movie a little, like now I give the movie more of a pass in terms of the script Mm -hmm. Because at first I was like, oh, these female characters are so poorly written. But now I, I if, if that's really the way that was intended, I get it. I don't know if that's the way it was intended, but I like that theory of that's the reason why it was intended. So, again, there's a lot to admire, a lot to appreciate about Oppenheimer. I just think that that last 45 minutes really drags the movie down. And I would have loved to see that maybe before or incorporated a little bit more throughout instead of just at the end. No, I think the the narrative for this, like when it does go boom and then just sticks to the courtroom stuff, it does end up feeling a little bit longer, but it's just a long film to begin with anyways. Um, I don't know. I don't know if keeping it at a straight, like this point to this point to this point could have improved it. I, I think Nolan plays with the nonlinear storytelling too much in a lot of his films. Um, Tenet was just way uh -huh. too much for me. The, the, the editing in that was crazy. Uh, and, and sometimes it can, it can really diminish the, the impact on the film. Uh, this, this to me, I was still just so fascinated. Like just every aspect of it still w was gripping to me. But I do agree. The pacing, it, it drops a little when it goes to there. But it yeah. is followed by one of my favorite scenes of it after the bomb drops when he's in with the audience and they're all st stomping their feet and the yeah. way that they show like kind of the world shaking around him. That like if I've ever seen what a panic attack looks like visually in a film, that was yeah. absolutely what it's like. And and it was it was just I don't know. It's Nolan's year, man. That's what I say. <laughs> <laughs> You're it Nolan. definitely is. I mean, listen, the, the, the Barbenheimer movement is that. insane. It's insane. Mm -hmm. Now, what was your number two? My number two was Blackberry. Oh, um, snap. Yeah, Blackberry. I, I, another movie like the gold. No one was talking about it. Just a small little indie film that I, I heard like some little online rumblings about. And everyone was talking about this man who you have on screen right now, Glenn Howerton. And I was like, you know what? It's playing out of theater. I got nothing else to see. Let me go check it out. I remember again, once again, being like one of two people in the movie theater. And just an engaging story. Great acting. Again, it's a twofer. This is really like a twofer movie. It's it's between him and uh, Jay Bruch Oh, no, actually it's a threefer because there's that other guy, mm -hmm. the guy who's also the filmmaker uh, of the movie. It's It's really just, again... Character work, story, performance. And um, just engaging, 
fascinating to watch. And and the fact that they were able to create this for such a shoestring budget, I think the budget was under $5 million. Mm -hmm. And they were able to go to all these different locations. There was a lot of traveling in the movie. You almost wonder, you're like, why did Air cost $80, $80 million and this movie cost five? I mean, yes, there's more actors and they clearly got paid more. But mm -hmm. like Air should have cost like $20 million instead right. of the $80 million price tag. But BlackBerry, just a fascinating story. Great performances. Um, seriously, I, I I struggled whether I want to put this one at number one or number two. Wow. Hey, I, I am right there with you as far as Glenn Howard goes. I've been a fan of the Golden God for so long. <laughs> with Always Sunny, I watched all the seasons back and forth. It was one of those pandemic comforts was just re-watching and re-watching. And every time we've seen him, the way that he – uh, plays that character specifically you knew that there was something deeper as far as his acting goes right and the fact that he's able to chew his teeth on something meaty that's a leading character and and just completely tear up the scenes just so well done uh, i love the direction of this i love the story about it's it's a cautionary tale on how innovation can really bite you in the ass if you're not quick to it and if your arrogance gets in the way of that innovation where you think that the only way that you can do it right is if you're doing it your way and not conforming or even to the extent of like seeing the trends change that BlackBerry had all of those issues <laughs> <laughs> the way that they were able to do it. And, and not just with Glenn Howard and Jay Bruchel's character is really integral yes. to it as well. They're, they're sympathetic. What's the, what's the Sympatico. word? Sympatico. Yeah. Sympatico. Venom. I was going to say Venom too. What's the word for that? Venom. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, they're they're like polar opposite characters yeah. that like, yeah, they're polar opposites. And like, they both have a different mindset, which is also kind of fascinating, which is why right. I love the poster, right? So the, the, the poster is sort of like Clint Howerton has like the devil ears and mm -hmm. like he has the angel, you know, the angel halo. And I, it really is. It's like it's it's someone who was innocent, who believed in the product, who was super nerdy, and someone who knew that they can exploit it for all it was worth. And that's ultimately the downfall was that the greed and the power and just like wanting to sell things and rush shit into production and not take take care of something is what killed the BlackBerry brand. It, it was like they became the biggest thing on the planet, but then they killed it because they didn't they just kept thinking of the focus of like more money, make it cheaper. We don't need to do this. People love this brand. They didn't get, you know, they didn't pick up on the times. They didn't right. adapt. And there's something so important to be said about technology in this movie and showing how quickly it evolves and that you have to stay up. I mean, look at Zoom. I mean, look at Skype. Why did Skype not become the go-to thing during the pandemic and Zoom did? Features. Exactly. Yeah. So and now Zoom has died because they just stopped trying to update it. They tried to they never made it better. They were like, oh, this is what you get. This is the best we're gonna have. So now everyone went over the Google Meet or Microsoft Teams or whatever, and there's too many people. Right. Uh, but it's such a good story. Uh, really something that you could apply to a lot of different companies right now. Yeah. Um, do I have to give my number one now? I'm just afraid. You do. You do. What's okay. your number one? You got to put a drum roll in. Hold on. <laughs> the number one <laughs> for the year is The Holdovers. Oh, yeah. <gasps> we both have the same number one movie? Do we? No really? shit. Oh, yes. Gosh. Yes. That is amazing. That deserves an applause. Absolutely. The Holdovers, oh, it's just one of the most beautiful films I've seen. And, and and really talk about an ensemble. This is a tiny ensemble that packs a huge punch. But all three of these characters, when it comes to Dominic Sessa, uh, Diving Joy Randolph with uh, Paul Giamatti, it is just, it's astounding to me what they were able to accomplish. Alexander Payne directed the hell out of it. I, I loved how it was written. I, I love that it's a Christmas film. It To me, this is kind of like if you were at your grandparents' house, right? And you go through all of their old VHSs and you're trying to find some dumb old Christmas movie for everybody to watch that they're not really going to. They're going to be doing something else. This is the one that you dust off that's like hidden behind something. 
And you're like, where was this Christmas classic my whole life? Because it's shot that way. It, it's made to look like it was it was filmed back then. And just just the way that they were able to weave in all these characters. And Paul Giamatti <laughs> is just one of the funniest people of the entire year. I loved his writing particularly. I loved his insults, hormonal vulgarians, genuine troglodytes. Like some of these, some of these insults like are burned into my, into my psyche. Now I want to use them in my daily, like talking with people at work and make sure that they have to look up and know what the insult is. That's what's brilliant. They have to Google what the insult is to know exactly what you call them. <laughs> but seriously, this one, this one was so impactful, um, had so much going to for it. And I don't know, it just, it hit me right in the heart. So I loved it. This is a movie for me that I saw a Telluride and I walked out and I said, I really liked it. I really liked it. And then it stuck with me. Mm. And I was thinking about it more and more. And then I saw it again. And I said, you know what? This is literally the best movie of the year. It's so sharply written and the performances, all three of them, like it's an odd pairing. Like everyone's an odd, like it's like an odd, it's like a buddy comedy hmm. with three people. Yeah. But they're all so real and they grow and they learn and they change. It just feels so lived in. And Alexander Payne, like I, I feel like if Alexander Payne didn't have the, the controversies that he had, he would have been in the, the director conversation. Mm -hmm. Because this movie looks like a movie that was shot in the late 70s, early 80s. Mm -hmm. it, it feels, it has the look, the feel, the tone, the cinematography, the editing. I mean, this is across the board, a spectacular film. Absolutely. I mean, the score, I mean, everything just works about this movie. And even I had a little bit of a problem initially with the setup of the story about the kids in the beginning, you know, and the kids in the beginning, how they just kind of all leave. And mm -hmm. you're like, you spend a little bit of time out with them, with them. And then all of a sudden they randomly leave. And I'm like, why were they there? Like, it made no sense. <laughs> right. And then I talked to the writer, and he goes, that's how it is at those schools. And he said that was, like, from his own experience. And I said, oh. So he gave me some perspective. So then I was like, okay, so I can't shit on that. If that literally came from, like, real pers perspective, mm -hmm. I'm just looking at it from an outsider, right, going, like, why are these kids just disappearing? But if he's telling me that that happened all along and that's part of something that he can relate to, I totally get why it's in the movie and I and I forgive it for that. Can so, I, and let me give a shout out to the writer too because oh yeah. this will only be able to come from a Utah boys perspective, right? That the Mormon student that yes. they didn't call Mormon, that they said he's LDS, he's a Latter Day Saint. That you only write that if you know that Mormons don't like being called Mormons. Yeah. That like it's it the, we literally they literally restructured their entire thing. I used to be LDS, and so like knowing that w when we were out on a mission, if somebody said you're Mormons, we're like well, actually we're the Church of Jesus Christ Latter Saints. <laughs> they they made it so funny to me. Um, it was just a small detail, but like it was those little attention to details that was just like wow, it does feel incredibly lived in, and the characters so real. Oh man, I mean those those there's that scene in the bar, right, with Paul Giamatti and and, mm. and Dominic. I mean, this is such a great scene. The scene at the at the Christmas table with them. I mean the chase just, sequence. The car the chase <laughs> scenes, like it just everything just feels like you're watching people that you want to spend time with, that you deeply care about, and that you enjoy being around, like, right? It's like Paul Giamatti might, is so good in this role. For him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like it's like it's like he's like this old curmudgeon. You're sitting there, and at first you're like, I don't know if I like this guy. He's kind of a prick. But mm -hmm. then as it as it goes on, you learn about him and what shapes him and why he's the way that he is. And I love movies that have characters that come full circle. Mm -hmm. And and I mean, this is the this to me, 
is this not just the best film of the year for for the performances but i mean i think it's the best written film of the year as well um i don't know if i would go it's the best directed film because the, the direction is so strong across the board with so many movies i mean i'm really like oppenheimer as we talked about barbie as we talked about like they're really right up there i mean even martin scorsese like with killers like you can say what you want about the movie but he directs the hell out of it right um but when you come to a script and you come to uh performances you don't get any better than the holdovers truly i'm so glad that we both had the same number one <laughs> genuinely did not dawn on me until we got here but man respectable list scott i think you have some great picks thank you you too you too my friend now, what? Where do we go from here? Where do you think 2024 is gonna go? Do you have any like initial like? Hmm, I might look out for this coming soon. Oh, I it's mean, just around the corner. I mean, listen, everyone's gonna laugh when they hear this, but I'm super excited for the two Chris and Stir movies that mm. are at, at that are at Sundance. Um, Love Lies Bleeding, right? That's the one. Right. And she's the other one. the award too, isn't she? She is, yes. Yeah, I mean, she's, listen, her career, my, a lot of people don't know this, her career started at Sundance. She mm. was in a movie called Speak, and uh, that's that's actually when I became a fan, um, mm. was seeing her in that that movie. Um, and it, it, it's, it's fascinating to see her go back with two very different movies, the, the Love Lies Bleeding is Rose Glass, who did um, St. Maud a couple years ago, a horror movie that A24 also released. Uh, very under-the-radar movie, very well-directed. I didn't love the, the story in that movie, but the direction was phenomenal. And I'm really excited about this. And then the other movie she has is with Steven Yoon, who, I mean, after Beef and Minari, I yes. mean, how can you deny this guy? He's an incredible actor. So the two of them, I'm very interested to see how that is. Um, I'm super excited about the Amelia Jones movie, uh, Warrior, uh, that's also playing at Sundance. Really looking forward to that. Um, I'm trying to think of like what else is coming out in 2024 that I'm I'm really really pumped to see. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't you know. I, I don't. Its own show, so we can have you back. Oh, okay. Yeah. I mean, we we should we should do that because I I really. Plus, we've been talking for almost an hour and a half. It's been it's been riveting though. I'm so excited that we got to do this. Thank you again, Scott, so much. Everybody down below, this is where you're gonna find him. Make sure that you are checking out all of his movie reviews, and please make sure to tune tune into the 2024 HCA Astro Film and TV Awards, both happening January 6th and January 8th. Make sure you hashtag hashtag Astros. Uh, this was so much fun. Is there anything else that you want to plug or anything that you're working on right now? Nope, just uh, just happy to get through award season alive. Because I mean, holy, we crap. did I mean, it, <laughs> we did it, we did it. I mean, then we're almost well, there. We're almost, we're almost we're crossing the line. Right. Well, again, thank you so much. You can check out all of my reviews on PatrickBadyReviews.com and on ABC Four for the Seed or Skip It show. And make sure that you're following me on Facebook, Instagram, all of that stuff. Thank you again, as always, for watching, and we will see. You